So we're ready to get started for today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Chuck's oh, okay. Chuck's good. good. Jackie's lounging. I bet Jackie Calcagney will be asleep within an hour. Look at her. She's yeah. gonna fall asleep. Jackie, you're gonna sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, part of Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt's lives that don't get a lot of attention, particularly with FDR, are the years from about 1908 to 1920. And if they do get attention, it's because it's in 1918 that Eleanor finds out about his affair with Lucy Mercer. And we'll talk a lot more about that next week. Um, I really want to spend a whole section talking about their relationship and how it's been portrayed by historians over the years. But there are some big things that happened to him. He's a young kid. Remember we talked about how he wasn't taken very seriously at Groton. He wasn't taken very seriously at Harvard. Um, he wasn't very athletic, so his way to um, get on the books, so to speak, at Harvard was to be on the uh, be the head of the Crimson, the, the school yearbook a paper. Um, that was his thing to, to make a mark. Most of his friends at Harvard, if you had asked them back in 19... 100, 1910, in that era, that he, what would think Franklin Roosevelt would have done, none of them would have said be president of the United States. They didn't take him seriously. Um, but look what he did. And apparently he told someone at one point that that's what his goal in life was, was to be president of the United States when he was young. Um, and, but if you don't take him very seriously, it seems like a pipe dream to most people. Uh, he's got money, he's got connections, but what is he doing with his life to be able to do that? Now, one of the first things that he did when he got out of Harvard was he went to law school. He went to Columbia Law School. Um, like a lot of these folks who do that and who are going to politics, they're doing it kind of as a mechanism to um, make themselves more marketable, to give themselves some knowledge about things that they're going to need the knowledge about. I remember once um, in Cheyenne going over to Laramie to the University of Wyoming Law School for dinner, and Morris Dees was there. Anybody ever heard of Morris Dees? Oh, yeah. Yes. So he was the speaker. And he said, you know, people always quote that line from Shakespeare that the first thing we should do is kill all the lawyers. <laughs> but no one knows the line before that, which is for the success of tyranny, the first thing we should do is kill all the lawyers. Wow. Jeez. Changes your perspective on that phrase a little bit, doesn't it? Lawyers understand how government works. They understand how contracts work. They understand how bureaucracy works. Um, it may get a little crazy and seem a little bit um, over the top at times, but in the end, I think we're, they're needed to some extent to um, help the process move along. One of the things that's fascinating about the world we live in now, I think, is people get so frustrated that things don't move quicker. Why doesn't the Senate do this? Why does the Senate do that? And the Senate and the House are designed to be slow. They're designed to put the brakes on so that people that go with these ideas have to rethink what they're doing and make sure they're not impacting everyone adversely to get something they want to get done, done. And so it's designed to have the House come up with the crazy ideas and then go to the Senate and they debate it. Now, we could have a whole class on whether or not that's still working. Um, but back in the day, and you don't see this much anymore, I think one of the worst things we did was let cameras in the legislature especially the national legislature, because all they do now is prime for the cameras and make themselves look good. Um, there's an old story. One of the things that happened when Newt Gingrich got famous, he got famous, he would go in the well of the house and talk. And the cameras, C-SPAN cameras are there and you'd see Gingrich talking and you'd think, wow, he's holding forth in the Congress and listen to every word he says. This is amazing. What an amazing guy. And Tip O'Neill once says, the speaker said, let's do something. And they pulled the cameras back Guess how many people were in the house listening to Newt talk? <laughs> <laughs> now they all have their hair coiffed. They all have these speeches primed. You don't get the F. Dirksons and people like that who, who spoke from the heart, who spoke without regard to what the audience was looking at them. It was, it was the, what they said mattered. Nowadays, they know how to get a 30-second soundbite into their speech, and they know that the cameras will film that and talk about that. It didn't used to happen back then. Um, so it's a different time. So um, Franklin decides after a while, going to law school, that he's bored. He never finishes law school. But oddly enough, he's allowed to take the bar exam. 
Teddy did the same thing. He didn't finish law school and took the bar exam. I personally don't understand how you don't finish law school and get to take the bar exam. Um, that'd be like not finishing graduate school and somehow taking your, you're not finishing your dissertation, but being allowed to be given a PhD. I don't get that, but mm -hmm. it's a law school thing, I guess. Um, but he, he, and he, he worked at a, a law firm in New York. Let me look at the name of it again, because it's pretty fascinating. They're still around. That's the thing I think is fascinating. These old law firms. Uh, let me see. I wrote it down. It's Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn. Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn. And they're still a law firm today. So they're one of the oldest law firms in New York. Um, and he got a job in the Admiralty wing of that. So he dealt with shipping. Not a bad job to have if you're a first year student out of law school, um, you pass the bar, you're connected and you have an interest in, in naval stuff. Franklin at one point in his life claimed that he had over 10,000 books on naval history and that he'd read all of them. And of course his cousin Teddy had written an actual history of naval history. warfare that was well, well respected. So there's a connection with the Roosevelt's and the sea. Um, remember who his mother was? His mother was a Delano and the Delano's made their money on the trade routes in the Far East. <laughs> overseas. Um, and that's how you traveled back then. There were no boats. You travel or planes. There were no, there were no planes. You, you traveled by boat. And being up on the Hudson River, there are two ways in and out by road and by the uh, Hudson River. So being involved in their Admiralty Wing was not a bad thing for him. I don't think it was challenging for him. But it's one of those jobs that he has <clears throat> throughout his life that kind of gives him a sense of, of what's going on in the world. It gives him things to throw in the back of his head and bring forward later on when he needs it in about five years or so. But again, he's this young man. He's just gotten married. He has um, kids coming. Um, he needs to make money. Remember, because mommy runs his, his pocketbook. Mama is in control of his pocketbook until the day she dies. <laughs> I don't understand that, but that works that way, I guess. But clearly, Franklin understands that um, this life as a lawyer is not going to be what he's going to do his whole life, and that there's things up ahead. Eleanor is frustrated at home because her job in that era, in the Victorian era, late Victorian, even Edwardian era, is to have babies and entertain if she has to. Well, that's one thing she hates doing. She's not a social person. She's not comfortable talking to people. She does not like small talk at parties. Maybe two or three people she knows she can do, but a cocktail party of 15, 20 people, not her thing. Um, luckily, as a lawyer, his connections with that kind of stuff aren't as much as they're going to be when he goes to the state senate and then goes to the uh, Navy Department a few years later. But by then, Eleanor's figured this stuff out. Um, she spends a lot of time with the children. They have nannies. Mama lives next door. Remember that house that Mama built them as a wedding present? Um, and it was a, a, a flat in New York that had one side for her and one side for them. Uh, interesting life. Um, but Eleanor learned how to deal with it. Um, now, she had done some stuff in, in her early years with social work. She had... Um, Spent some time as part of the Consumers League in New York and had worked and seen what life was like in the Bowery part of New York City. If you've ever been to New York City, the Bowery is down by City Hall, down that area, the Lower East Side area. If you want to watch a movie about what it was like to be poor in New York, watch Gangs in New York by Martin Scorsese. Hell of a movie. It's violent as all get out because it's a Scorsese movie. Um, but it gives a really good sense of what life was like in the city in a part of New York that's just gone now. If you go to where the five points were, which is where the, the slum was, there's a playground. Hard to realize what it was what it was there, but it was this horrible place to be. She had been down there. Remember, Teddy Roosevelt had been a big reformer. He was her favorite uncle, so she was aware of the struggles of people outside her realm, outside her world. So, but she doesn't have a lot, women can't vote. So their job, if they do anything, is to go check up on these things, make sure the poor be taken care of. But there's not much they can do because they can't vote, they can't exercise, they can't get people elected 
who support them because you can't get a woman to run and they're not gonna listen to you if you're if you're a woman because you the guy they didn't listen to you unless you're at home unless you have a spouse like eleanor franklin had to set up but by and large women are ignored their jobs are to make things and make babies but that's changing and it gets back to shelley's question about what would roosevelt's life have been like as a politician if it had just been men allowed to vote and i'll have to look at that one shelley because that's 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 a really unique question um so if you're a young man, you have a, a growing family and, and, a, and a dutiful wife, so to speak, and you want to be in politics, what do you do? Um, you got to wait sometimes. Timing's everything. And a successful politician can understand and realize when the time is right to run, and when the time is not right. Um, and where FDR lived, in Hyde Park in Dutchess County, New York. It's very Republican. Um, there are a few Democratic office holders here and there. There is the, um, the county sheriff was a Democrat. Um, and the mayor of Poughkeepsie was a Democrat. But other than that, there weren't a lot of Democrats in elected office. It was like living in Wyoming. <laughs> 55 to one Republican to Democrat. We used to joke that when I left Wyoming to move here, number of Democrats went from six to five. And it's not a lot of untruth that there's only four members of the House in the Wyoming House that are Democrats and three in the Senate. So it's kind of sad. Um, so you can imagine if the county chair comes to uh, Franklin and says, hey, you're a young guy. Your last name's Roosevelt. You're a Democrat. You should run for office here in, in Dutchess County. But no one's won in Dutchess County in the Democrat since the time of man. I mean, it's been all Republicans. Um, if you thought, if they thought he would just run, just to run and do something, they, they were wrong because this is not a guy who's just going to run to be bored and just run for as, as a lark. He's going to do this full steam ahead. Um, they also knew that if they asked Franklin to run, they wouldn't have to raise a lot of money for him because he had a lot of money himself, or so they thought. Um, and they went to him hat in hand and they said, hey, would you like to run for office? He said, well, I guess so. Why not? But I'm going to do this full steam ahead, um, and he did. Um, I want to read you one of his speeches. But what's ironic to me is that he only had a month to run. In October 1910, he was recruited to run. He accepted the nomination for his party. At the party convention, only one person voted for him. That's all they needed was one vote, and they didn't let anybody else vote. They just oh, he's done. He's nominated by acclamation. He's our nominee for state senate. Um, this was state senate number 20, district number 26 um, in New York. And the FDR library has copies of many of his speeches. I was trying to find an audio version of that. Um, I'm still trying to find an audio version from 1920 when he ran for VP, but <clears throat> here is what Franklin said in a speech um, in Poughkeepsie week before the election. The Democrats in Dutchess County have certainly made good their promise to clean up conditions here. They have certainly purged the city government of the barnacles that clung to it and impeded it. Now it is time that they were given a chance to do something for the state. Conditions in the state are as bad under Republican rule as they have been in Poughkeepsie before the redemption. Uh, the surest way to start this state house cleaning is to send to Albany a Democrat legislature. If you elect me to represent you, I, I will be a real representative. I will devote my energy and my time to your service alone. I will represent every one of you I'll be your representative every day of the 365, every hour of the 24. That is my promise. I ask you to give me the chance to fill it. Wow. That's a pretty big, I will be, he's saying I'll be on call 24 seven, 365. Now he knows he can't fulfill that, but it sounds good. He spent the whole month. Uh, John, do you need this thing? My tech guy needs my iPad now. I'm giving it back to you. John, I'm going to get your iPad if you want it. Oh, okay. Um, here, say hi, everybody. Say hi. No. <laughs> say hi, everyone. Hi. Hey. Hi there. Hi. Hi there. Anyway, I'm going to change that back. Paul? Um, so what FDR did was threw himself full speed into the campaign. 
he rented a red convertible car and a driver. Wow. So in, in that part of New York, cars weren't seen much other than a few houses. And to have this red car pull up at any campaign event, any Legion Hall, any clam bake, any church event, any social event of any kind, <coughs> he would show up and he could get there. Now, Dutchess County, is Dutchess County, Hudson River, Poughkeepsie and Hyde Park. A little bit of the northern part up here was part of the district. A little bit of the southern part was part of the district too, but mainly it was Dutchess County in New York. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you Google that on a, on a map on your computer or your phone, you'll see where it is better. Kind of a rough sketch. He campaigned 15, 16 hours a day in his little red car. One day he campaigned so excitedly, he drove over the state line Connecticut. So, um, he realized about halfway through his speech he was in Connecticut and <laughs> got a big chuckle out of that and went back to New York. Um, in fact, you know, they didn't have GPS, so nowadays you do that and your phone will tell you you're in Connecticut. Or you'd see it on the line, but back then they didn't know. Um, but he had this advantage of having this vehicle to drive around the district and go everywhere. No one gave him a chance, but he showed them how wrong they were by just campaigning harder than anybody else. Um, and he won. And he won not by a huge margin, but by enough to show, hey, um, we can do this. So now he becomes this star, a Democrat Roosevelt. Ooh, what's going on with that? That's crazy. By the way, it cost him about 2,500 bucks to run that campaign. Um, what year was that, Mike? What's that? What year? 1910. Okay. Luckily for him, too, it was a Democratic year. Uh, let me find you some pictures of Franklin campaigning um, for the state Senate. There's a very famous picture of him. I love the picture of him because he has... Um, well, you can tell it's Franklin. Where is he? Okay. So it, it gets down to the fact that I think just campaigning means you have to get out and talk to people, knock on doors, say hello. People want to meet their candidates. They want to know who these people are that seek to represent them. Um, and if you don't do that, Work. See this picture of him here? That's 1910. Oh, wow. You can see it's him, but it's a lot much younger looking version of him. Yeah. He's already got the Prince Nez glasses. Um, there's a picture of the campaign poster from that year. Huh. So he spent his money well. Um, and then it's off to Albany to be a state senator. And that's another world in and of itself. Um, has anyone ever heard of Tammany Hall? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. What is, what is Tammany? Somebody tell me what Tammany Hall is all about. That's a machine to keep Democrats in power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? Huh? Yeah. Based in New York. It was corrupt. Very corrupt. Corrupt. <laughs> but it was not unlike, say, the Curly machine in Boston, or it's that kind of machine is going to be corrupt. But it also did a lot of good things for people. So it did. It did work. The poor were helped out, and people got jobs. You know, there are stories of people coming off the boats into New York Harbor and being given a place to stay as long as they pledged their boat to, say, Boss Tweed, who was the number one boss of Tammany Hall for a long time. Um, but it was really a spoil system for immigrants. It helped immigrants out. We'll get you a job. You keep us in power. Uh, again, if you want to watch an example of that, watch Gangs in New York. It's a Scorsese movie, so it's violent, but it's well acted. Daniel Day-Lewis is in it. Um, but it really gets at this whole system of how those cities were so tightly compressed and so many people in them, how people kept in job. People would go to Tammany Hall groups within Tammany Hall had their own fire departments. And so there'd be a fire and one group would show up at the fire to put the fire out 
another group would show up with the fire to put the fire and they'd fight over who got to do put up the fire well in the process the building burned down <laughs> all about, politics. All about <laughs> getting there first um oh. notoriously corrupt system and they didn't just run new york city they ran the state really and so when franklin got to albany as a state senator he was pledged to rid the state of corruption when he talks about Republican corruption in his speeches, he's not just talking about Republicans, he's talking about Democratic Tammany Hall. And he came, nothing better if you want to get your name made for yourself as a new young legislator than to come in as the anti-corruption guy. You're everybody's hero. Um, so one of the guys, <laughs> he showed up, where's the line I had today about Franklin? When he showed up in Albany, he was this young, good-looking Roosevelt, who's a Democrat, and that got him a lot of attention, which other politicians don't like. If you show up at a new job, and you have no experience, or everybody knows about you already, and they're wanting over you, giving you press coverage, the other guys don't like that very much. One of the guys in the legislature said, this, this fellow is still young. Wouldn't it be safer to drown him before he grows up? <laughs> oh, wow. That's the kind of reputation he had. They're like, oh, good Lord, who's this jack wagon that thinks he's going to get rid of all of us and mess all our lives up? Um, and then Franklin actually set about being the anti-corruption guy. He was, and he had a few other members of the, of the legislature with him. This is where he meets Al Smith for the first time. And he um, becomes part of an anti-boss group that runs afoul of the machine right away. This isn't going to go right. oil and water. This is not working really well. Um, but he sticks to his guns and he runs afoul of boss Murphy, who's the longest serving boss of Tammany Hall, perhaps not the most famous boss of Tammany Hall. That would be boss Tweed. But boss Murphy and Roosevelt go at each other again and again and again and again and again. And Franklin doesn't give up. He fights him tooth and nail, particularly on a, on a, on a Senate appointment. Remember, the legislatures at this time appointed the senators. There was no longer, there was no, not yet a direct election of senators. That comes within a few years. But the legislatures controlled who the Senate candidates were and how they, you know, that process. It was a different world altogether. And they wanted some corrupt guys and Roosevelt and his gang stood up against them. And they finally got a candidate for the Senate that Roosevelt could agree that was okay. So already learning very quickly how to compromise, how to give in a little bit here, give a little bit there, how to do not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. i say that again, that's, a, that's an old political maxim. Do not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Hmm. Give a little bit here, give a little bit there. Keep your eye on the big picture and not on the small picture. If you saw last week in the news, um, John Kerry's comments about a, a certain legislator from Kentucky who voted against the uh, stimulus package last week. Because mm -hmm. he will not let his small government version of the world be even pulled apart a little bit. He's so focused on that, they can't see the big picture. And politicians, they pride themselves on being, I'm a guy who is like principled. I will not stand for anything other than what I believe in. But those careers usually end very quickly. You have to have a broader, long-term range picture of things before you can succeed in politics. And Roosevelt learns that very quickly in Albany. Eleanor likes Albany because she is, again, her own person. Mama does not follow them to Albany, does not live with them in Albany. Um, so Eleanor kind of has her first real attempt to be on her own. And without that pressure from her mother, she can be more sociable. You have to be a little more sociable now if you're a politician's wife. The Roosevelt's have a nice house in Albany. Franklin is perceived very quickly as being a leader of the anti-boss group, the anti-Tammany group. And so there are people buzzing around. Um, but these are actually some good years for Eleanor. She's able to put some things into practice. She's watching politics be practiced. She goes to her first national convention in 1912. Um, she's paying attention. She's finding that she has an aptitude and a, and a gift for understanding politics and that she can get along with people. Um, and it's during these times in uh, Albany that Franklin meets perhaps 
And it's awfully hard to say who influences Franklin Roosevelt more. You can pick a handful of people. They've all got that big influence. One of the people influences the most in his entire life is a young, as a young man, an older man named Louis Howe. Now, Louis Howe has been characterized as a weasened old man, as a dwarf, um, as ugly, um, as uncouth. Um, he's all these things. He's a little old guy who's been around politics forever. He doesn't look like a politician. His hair is messed up. He's had, I think he had small packs when he was younger, so his face is all pocked. He smoked little cigars, and he would never clean the ashes off his vest, so he'd smoke the cigar, and it would be all over his clothes. Uh, Franklin's kids and grandkids, the thing they remember the most about Louis Howe was the smell of him. He smelled like a combination of bad feet, lack of deodorant, and cigar smoke. <laughs> But he understood politics. He understood how this all works. He understood. Um, can you all hear me still? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, something is coming up on my screen. A phone number is coming up. I don't recognize it. It's Catherine Smith. Oh, okay. How are you? Hi, Mike. Great. How are you? Well, we're in the middle of my class. What can I do for you? Well, you, you had me on your list to call in. I did? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, well, welcome. Enjoy. We're talking about the <laughs> Roosevelt's in their early years. If you want to well, help a little bit, or you can. Okay. This is Catherine, everybody. Yeah. She's the woman who wrote the book. I'm Hi. Missy Lahan. This is, this is Missy Lahan calling. I just, just wanted you to send greetings from the president. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He knows right. a thing or two about viruses. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. We're talking. We're talking this week, Catherine. I'm, I think we're, I'll talk to you again later on about scheduling okay. this event. Um, yeah. Exciting. So. All right. All right. Well, carry on. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know where, where that came from. Anyway, um. So, this is a, a really interesting guy, and he, he adores Franklin Roosevelt. He knows Franklin Roosevelt can do something with his life, even when most people don't. He doesn't believe, he doesn't think he knows Frank. He calls him my esteemed future president. Kind of a mouthful. Um, you know what? If you're a young politician getting started out in the world and getting a, a handle on things, you want to have a guy like Louis Howe around you who believes in everything you do and has the wherewithal and the smarts to push that agenda to get you elected to whatever office you want to get elected to. Um, Franklin finds, finds a way to give him a small stipend. Um, Lou is married and has kids. He's never home. His family's from, um, his wife's family's from Fall River, Massachusetts. She's actually related to the Borden family. We know what the Borden family's like. <laughs> Yeah, what's the old what's the old line? Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother forty wax. Once she saw what she had done, she gave her father forty one. Yeah. I was taught that. That's a, that's one of those things that keeps coming up in uh, your school, no matter what where you're at in life. My generation learned that one. Your generation clearly learned that one. Um, that's fascinating. Um, but old, but she's he's never home. And you read the letters between Louis and his wife excellent biography about him written by a, a wonderful writer named Julie Finster called um, FDR's Shadow. Louis Howe, the force that shaped the Roosevelt's. Um, at first, Eleanor doesn't like him either. Mama really doesn't like him because he's everywhere. I mean, you can't go through the Roosevelt house without tripping over Louis Howe. Uh, but Franklin trusts him. Louis knows how this game is played, how this game works. Um, <clears throat> it's really, really exciting for Franklin because he's got someone who believes in what he can do, who believes he can get him elected president by following somewhat his cousin's template. To get involved in state government, which both of them did. Um, and then um, Franklin can kind of see a path. He'll go to Washington. He'll go do this and then he'll be president someday. And Louis is constantly working. He's an old newspaper guy. He knows everyone. He knows where all the bodies are buried. Probably in some cases, literally. Um, but he can he make sure FDR gets the credit for things that FDR should get credit for, probably gets credit for things he shouldn't get credit for. That's the nature of politics, but Louis Howe is there. 
Um, and it's like having your own built-in consultant all the time. Um, and I'll tell you one thing, I've worked in politics a lot of my life. You have to get the spouse of the candidate with you. Hi, on Sherry. This, or it doesn't work. Whether it's a male candidate or female candidate, you have to get the spouse on board or it just won't work. And I've done a lot of work over my years of working with campaigns. And if the, the spouse is not ready to go on something, it, 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 it's not going to happen. So it took a while. It's hard to get work. good help these days. I'm going <laughs> to. You all hear Gene still? You can mute him if you want. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so it's important to have that kind of help and that kind of support if you have a political career ahead of you. Eleanor and, and Louis don't get along too well at first, but he kind of builds on her after a while. She sees that he really has Franklin's career in his best interests, that Louis doesn't want anything. He doesn't look for a job. He doesn't want to be an office with a, a throne. He just wants to help Franklin out. He thinks Franklin's the guy. Um, so he's around. So she gets used to him. Mama never gets used to him. But Eleanor gets And they actually become very, very good friends in post-1920 in the polio uh, part of Franklin's life. In 1912, Franklin runs for re-election. Um, and in that midst of that campaign, he gets sick. He gets the flu, he gets pneumonia. And he's bedridden. So Louis Howe runs the campaign and campaigns for Franklin all over the district as if he were Franklin. And the numbers are actually better the second time around than they were the first time, which I'm sure Louis liked to remind Franklin of that once in a while. He actually won by more votes campaigning for him than Franklin did by running as himself. But um, that's the kind of guy Louis Howe was. He didn't ask. He just did, went out and did what he had to do to get Franklin reelected to the legislature. If you're a legislator and you want to go forward in politics, if you don't win that first reelection campaign, you might want to rethink what you're doing. You have to win that re-election campaign. Um, if Franklin had not won, he probably would have just gone back to Hyde Park and been the country squire. He knew how important it was. And so how frustrating it must have been for him to have been sick and to rely on Louis Howe. But Louis did it. He knew all the people, knew where to go, and they got re-elected. Well, who else is paying attention to this sort of thing? Uh, not just the press in New York but other people are starting to pay attention. The new White House is paying attention. 1912, who's the new president of the United States in 1912? Anybody know? Woodrow Wilson. Oh, okay. Woodrow came in 1912. Um, Teddy, got, Teddy had been VP in 1900. President McKinley was assassinated in 1901. Teddy ran for re-election in 1904. He then appointed his cleared the way for his friend um, William Howard Taft to be president. And then Taft, in Teddy's mind, had betrayed everything he had stood for. So Teddy ran against him in, the, in a three-way campaign as progressive, the Bull Moose candidate. Uh, remember, too, that in 1912, that Teddy was almost assassinated. He was in Milwaukee giving a speech, and a man shot him. Um, and... It's amazing because Teddy went on and gave the speech for, of course, Teddy didn't speak for five minutes. He spoke for an hour. Um, and the bullet was still in him. He said, I just got, I just got shot. I got a speech to give. He gave the speech and then he collapsed. They took him to the hospital and the bullet never removed it. It was always in him for the rest of his life. But it went through his wadded up speech. He held up the speech. There's blood on it. And there's a hole in it. Um, that's the bull moose attitude. All right. Franklin's <laughs> biggest worry in 1910 and 1912 was that Teddy would come into his district and campaign for the Republican. But fortunately for Franklin, Teddy's family values mattered more than his political values, so he stayed out of the district. Um, the results in 1912 were interesting because Wilson won, but Roosevelt came in second, Taft came in third. That's how the love Teddy Roosevelt was by the people of this country. He was a, a, a giant um, in people's minds. So when Roosevelt started to put together a cabinet in Washington, he's casting him out for new young people to be part of this. And he has to look no further than Albany. Here's this young man who's just been reelected. He's just, he's still in his thirties. Roosevelt said, hey, I got this. Wilson says, I got this. The other Roosevelt is a Republican who kind of almost beat me. Let's make an amend to the family and get the Democrat Roosevelt down here to Washington, give him a job. Well, since Franklin 
knew and had written a lot about naval stuff and had read over 10 books on naval history. He's the guy. And his background in the Admiralty wing of the law firm he worked in helped him too. And of course, his desire to go do this, he's not afraid to go off to Washington. So here he goes. He's only been in the legislature for three years. That's like somebody from um, Illinois being in the state legislature, he left the U.S. Senate, and then becoming president two years later. It's timing. It's timing. Things happen. Things fall into place like that sometimes. So off he goes to Washington. Oh, my God, poor Eleanor is going to be freaking out because now she has to go. It's one thing to be a, a entertaining wife of three or four people in Albany. Now she has to go to Washington as the wife of the assistant secretary of the Navy. Um, and now she's required to go amongst the houses in D.C. and leave her sylvan calling card and say, hey, um, come visit. Um, we're having a cocktail party. Uh, now she has to be entertaining people by the dozens in her house. And these folks, remember, the, the, the Roosevelt's are very different personalities. <coughs> um, Franklin loves to be the center of attention. He loves to have people talking to him. He loves to be laughing and telling stories. Eleanor would sooner hide in the draperies and not talk to anybody. Well, she finds a way to do it because she understands and she says more than once, she's very interested in his career, what he wants to do and where he's going. And she wants that wife who is part of that. So um, she learns to talk to people. Okay. 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 Who has the radio on or the TV on? Yeah, hold on. I'll turn it off. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> Mike? Yeah. That spot where you give me permission is also a spot where you can mute everybody with one click. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> hey, uh, um, so poor Eleanor has to go down she has to be everything she's not doesn't want to be um, and again th at the time period what are women's roles in society viewed as the women's movement is just really picking up steam at this point trying to find a, a, a way to be involved in that is somewhat difficult but her job is to be the assist, wife of the assistant secretary of the Navy, is to have her household, um, be the, the dutiful wife, be the supportive spouse. Um, she does a pretty good job with that. I don't think she ever gets comfortable with it, but she does it. And I think that's a sign of who she is as a person, um, that she can be something she's not necessarily thought she could be. And she can do it. And people enjoy her. They come to the parties and like, wow, the Mrs. Rosa was really engaging. She's really really pleasant, she's really smart. She really supports her husband, this is so wonderful. Um, I don't think it's fooling anybody that in that sense, but I think she's really able to do something she didn't think she could do, and it benefits them, they're together, um, they're spending time together. Um, but it also, he's gone a lot. Now at the Navy Department, he works, the Secretary of the Navy is a guy by the name of Josephus Daniels. And one of the eminent Roosevelt historians um, Jeffrey Ward believes that Josephus, Josephus Daniels was the most patient man in the history of the United States. Because he's kind of a dowdy, older guy who's been around. He's kind of a bureaucrat. And here comes this breeze into the Washington establishment, this breath of fresh air, who not only is the guy who, when he walks in the office, you hear him a mile away, but he undercuts Daniels in almost everything Daniels does. Publicly, privately, um, Franklin's trying to get ahead, and he sees Daniels as being in the way. There's a very famous picture of the two of them standing. If you Google FDR Navy, there's a picture of he and Daniels standing at the Navy Department, looking out. The Navy Department is not too far from the White House, looking out the, over the balcony at the White House. <coughs> and Daniels said to him, said, You notice that picture of us? We're both smiling. I'm smiling because it's a nice day. You're smiling because you think you live in that nice house next door someday. 
The Rose Bowl. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So he's always got his mind on the next thing. He's always thinking about what's up ahead. Now, being the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, by and large, kind of a boring job. But for Franklin Roosevelt, as a Teddy Roosevelt, remember Teddy Roosevelt was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1898. And when McKinley wasn't really paying attention to world affairs, Teddy was building the Navy up and getting ready to go to war with Spain. And who's this guy in the assistant? He's not, this is a pencil pusher down there. But it's actually a, a job of life. It's like being the parks commissioner in New York, like Robert Moses was. Parks commissioner? What kind of job is that? It's a huge job. You know where everything is, where all the money is, where all the contracts are, where all the people are. It's not a flashy job. It's not a job that gets lots of PR. But wow. Can you change how things work in that job being the parks commissioner? So being the assistant secretary of the Navy is for Roosevelt like that. Um, but Daniels loves him. He, he's, he knows he's undercutting him all the time, but he doesn't care. He knows that Roosevelt has a career. He's kind of on the way out of his kind of life. But it also gives Franklin a chance to learn a lot of things that are going to help him out later on in his life. Um, it gives him oversight over all the civilian employees. He mediates labor disputes and develops a reputation for fairness, which is going to help him in his career down the road. Um, he meets people throughout the, the country through contract discussions and visits to naval sites and shipyards. Um, it's during this time he meets a young shipping magnate at the uh, Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Mass, named Joseph P. Kennedy, and their paths will cross off and on over the years. Um, one of the things that Roosevelt also did was, I forgot to mention this, in 1914, um, he decided he would run for the Senate in New York. We talked about how the, the, it was, the legislature ran, he had to get the legislator to approve you, and then they put the name forward, and it was all, there was no direct election of senators back then. And he ran such a bad campaign, and he got really badly beaten. But he learned a lot about strategic alliances and who to talk to and how those things worked and relationships. The thing about FDR, I think at the end of the day, we'll realize this is a guy who keeps everybody guessing as to what he's really doing. Everyone thinks they know him, and nobody really knows him. Does that make sense? He's pretty cagey. He's pretty smart, but he, he's got things juggling all the time. Um, never let the left hand the right hand's doing and with him that's really really true um part of the benefit of being the assistant secretary of the navy early on is he is learning how the bureaucracy works he is learning how the government works from the inside in a place where he doesn't have to get a lot of attention he can go do what he wants to do and pay attention and learn stuff so when he's president and we come to getting us out of the depression and or beefing us up for the war, you want a guy who understands how the basic mechanics of government work. A lot of people come through and they get elected president and they've never been in politics before and they think they know how things work or they think they can snap their fingers it'll work, but they don't understand intricacies of government. So that doesn't necessarily help them. They think they know better than everybody else. Um, the only guy I know of who quite like president the sense of how politics works is Lyndon Johnson. Well, Lyndon Johnson went to Washington as a uh, congressional staff member. He wasn't even a, a congressman at the time. And, you know, staff member? What do they do? Well, they run the damn place. Um, he got himself elected. There was, a, there was a little Congress, they called it, and it was all the staffers, all the people that worked in the offices. Uh, and they had their own group. And Lyndon Johnson got himself elected to that, that job. And the way he did it was to get to be friends with all the other staffers. <coughs> he protected his congressman, but he also worked. And one of the things he did, this is so Lyndon Johnson, they all lived in, a, in a, like a boarding house on Capitol Hill before they all had homes and other stuff. All the staffers lived in this same building. Lyndon Johnson would take three or four showers a day because he would go into the bathing room when a congressman staffer was in that he wanted to get to know and take a shower and then talk to him. And then you can't hide anything <laughs> when you're in the shower with people. <clears throat> a great line about Churchill meeting Roosevelt and Churchill's towel dropped. 
And Roosevelt said, well, there's nothing we're hiding between us now, is there? <laughs> <laughs> I hate to put that image of your head of a naked Winston Churchill, but there you go. But Johnson moved up the ladder in this group and knew how, how the power levels were, levers were by getting to nobody to the expense of taking four to five showers a day. He must have been a really clean smelling guy. That's a bit of a session. <laughs> but Roosevelt's the same way. He understands where people are. He understands what makes things work. He understands how the, the levers of government maneuver. Um, it's like, we could probably ask Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. Um, Howdy. Once in Wyoming, I had a, a county party meeting and a professor came and talked about government from a textbook. It was fine. Then I had a legislator talk about government. She said, throw it all out because that's not how it works. It's completely different when you're on the ground, hands on. And Roosevelt understood that. Um, now, the downside about living in Washington um, in these days is that there's no air conditioning. They say one of the worst things they did in Washington was put air conditioning in because they used to all go home for the summertime. They cleared mm -hmm. the city out. But now they all stick around because there's AC and they can all be comfortable living there. Um, mm -hmm. So back in the day, um, families would leave. Some of the bureaucrats would stick around and the families would go away. The Roosevelt family would come up to Campobello. And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. We'll have the guys from Campobello talk about that some more. Um, but Eleanor was gone a lot of the summer. Now, Eleanor had hired a social secretary to help her keep track of all these appointments and calling cards and things she needed to do. And if you can imagine that Eleanor needed to hire a social secretary to do what, the job for her, at that level, being the assistant secretary of the Navy's wife, Amanda was like to be the secretary of the Navy's wife, or the vice president's wife, or the pres just the amount of bureaucracy that goes into surviving this stuff just unfolds twofold. Um, but um, Eleanor Howard is this woman named Lucy Mercer. She's young, she's beautiful, she's Catholic, she's from an old Southern family. She and Eleanor get along very, very well. She gets ingratiated into the family. Um, I'm laughing. There's an orchid commercial going around where the guy comes and help do the termites, and he's really good at singing. Next thing you know, he's teaching the kids how to play the banjo. So that kind of ingratiating yourself in the family. And Lucy becomes part of the family. And as far as we know, there's nothing untoward between her and Franklin at the beginning when Eleanor's around. But when Eleanor's gone for six or seven weeks, Campobello, and Frank was still in, in Washington working, and Lucy's around. Lucy gets transferred out of the house after a while, and she gets herself transferred to the Navy Department, and she gets herself transferred to Franklin's office. So clearly something's going on with these two. But I want to talk more about that in a week or two, because um, it's a very complex relationship, unlike like most of Franklin's relationships he has with people. Men and women are complicated. But for the most part, she's around, and then when Eleanor is gone, there are stories start percolating back to her up at Campobello that Franklin is not being who he should be, that he's spending way too much time with Lucy. I think part of that's just Franklin's boredom. He can't handle sitting in the house by himself for months at a time. Um, he needs to be doing something. He needs to have people around him. And I think the relationship starts in that kind of, hey, let's go. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm bored. Can you come with me to this? Oh, sure. Let's. But it develops into something else down the road. Eleanor hears about it. Because one of the people in Washington who sees Franklin and Lucy tooling around uh, D.C. in a car is Alice Roosevelt Longworth. And she's the Republican who hates the Democrats. And she hates Eleanor in particular. And she's not afraid to say snotty things and let people know that she knows things. And she's no paragon of virtue. She's, she's been cheated on and cheating on her husband for years since they got married. Uh, her daughter is the illegitimate daughter of a senator from Montana. <laughs> Um, so it's a unique, it's a, it's a rarefied world there in Washington. Um, especially back in the day when half the town leaves, what are you going to do the rest of the time? You're going to, people's lives interact. When your wife's not around for some of these folks, what's the line? When the cat's away, the mouse shall play or whatever it is. It happens. It happens. It's part of life down there. He's lonely. He's sad. Here's this vivacious young woman who his family knows who's around and the time they spend together develops into something that nearly destroys the Roosevelt story before it even really begins too much. 
But so Franklin is paying attention to all this Navy stuff. He's helping build the Navy up. Everyone knows war is coming in spite of President Wilson's desire to keep us out of war. Something's going to give, and it finally does. And the U.S. is pretty much ready. It doesn't take a lot of time to get us because they've been working on this for a long time. Something else you see that Roosevelt in the 30s, he can talk about peace in our time. He can talk about you will not be dragged off to fight in foreign wars, but at the same time, He's making damn well sure that if that comes, we're ready and prepared. And that's what real presidential leadership is all about. So he learns this as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Um, so when the war starts, the Navy's ready to go. Ships are being built. There's a very famous picture of him. I'll show you this. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Any questions right now? And of course, for Franklin, as a young, vivacious guy, he wants to go fight. He wants to be in the war. Um, Teddy wants to fight in the war. Teddy goes to Wilson and says, put me in. I'll take the Rough Riders back. We'll do, like, dude, you can't do that. Come on. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's a, a feeling for guys, particularly at that time, who had been involved in martial arts to that extent and, and military stuff, that age doesn't matter. You can go do that. You have to, your country's calling. You should go fight. Franklin's one of those. He's a little younger, but Teddy wants to go fight. Um, so this picture here, you can all see that, is of a ship being built. The keel's being laid. And then the van in the, um, way down here with a bowler is Franklin D. Roosevelt. He's the Assistant Secretary of Navy. Part of his job is to go to places where they're launching ships and help launch them and inspect the factory to make sure they're up to code. That ship there in that picture, USS Arizona. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. But that one's sinking. You're all going, here we go. Wow. Ooh, dude. You blew our minds. Um, the, the, you know, the, the bureaucratic world, the elite establishment world, it's kind of a small world. And that picture, I, that was mine too, but now I'm like, I'm not surprised if he's the guy running around making sure the ships are getting built. And that's when the ships that gets built during this time. Wow. But now, when you see that ship blown up in video of Pearl Harbor, that must have, Roosevelt knew that. He had, that had to really hit home. Those are his guys, and that's his ship, in a sense. Um, there's an old story that in 1962, during the missile crisis, when the blockade was set up um, by the Kennedy administration against the Soviet ships, that one of the first ships to stop a um, Russian ship was the USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., oh, which wow. was the president's brother. You can actually go see yes. the, the uh, battleship cove down there and all this other crap's blown away. Go down there and see it. There's the Kennedy, there's a, a lionfish, which is an old submarine, there's a PT boat. But uh, Bobby apparently said, he said, where's the model of my ship? And Jack said, what are you talking about? We used to have a model of my ship. And he said, what do you mean it's your ship? He goes, I served on that ship when I got out of college for a while, right at the end of the war. And the president said, technically, Bobby, as commander in chief, it's my ship. <laughs> All about a perspective, right? So Franklin finally gets the opportunity towards the end of the war to go overseas to see what's going on. Um, he, this is as close as he's going to get to combat. He gets pretty close to combat in some cases. Um, but it's an exhausting trip, and on the way home, he gets sick. He gets so sick, they have to carry him off the ship on a stretcher. And he's put in bed for a month just to recover. We all know what that's like, being quarantined, can't go to your house. <laughs> the problem was that Eleanor unpacked his bags. Oh. And in the bags were a packet of letters all nicely tied up from Lucy Mercer. And this is where the wheels come off for a while on that. We'll talk about that next week more. Just to give you a sense of what it was like. Um, that's a, a dark side for the Roosevelts, obviously. But within a year, something has happened to recover. I do not believe it was just like she made an agreement. Okay, you do what you want to do, and I'll support you because I can do what I want to do. There's, it's more complicated than that. We'll talk about that. But in 1920, the Democratic Party comes calling again, and they want a um, vice president. Uh, they want a new, young part of the ticket, and they nominate James Cox from Ohio. He's the governor. 
to be the um, presidential candidate. But um, they're looking around for someone new to kind of put some vim and vigor in the campaign. And they go to FDR. He's this young state senator. He's the assistant secretary of the Navy. He's a Democratic Roosevelt. Let's pick him. So they do. He's only 38 years old. Again, he's following TR's timeline. State legislature, assistant secretary of the Navy. Now he's been picked for vice president. And he's two years younger than Teddy when Teddy did it, too. He's ahead of the curve. Now, back then, vice presidents did not, did not, or presidential candidates did not campaign. They sat at home. You literally came, Warren G. Harding, they came to his house in, Ohio, in Marion, Ohio, and people would gather by the hundreds on his lawn, listen to him talk. Oh, this Governor, this Senator Harding, he's so wonderful. But Cox and Roosevelt were different. They started campaigning. Roosevelt actually campaigned all across the country, which was unheard of. And he campaigned for candidates from state senate to comptroller to dog catcher. Anybody would have him come in and talk, he would go talk to them. Because even then, he's thinking, these are people I know that in years to come, I can rely on them to help me out. If I do a good turn for them, they'll be with me down the road. Um, one, one person said to Franklin that during this campaign, are you under any illusions that you're going to win? And Franklin said, nope, they knew they were going to lose, but their attitude was to campaign positively, not do anything stupid that brings the campaign down, um, just to be who you are. They got crushed, crushed by the Harding Coolidge campaign. But Franklin acquitted himself well. He got to meet lots of people. Um, See if I can find a picture. Any questions? I want to find a picture of something I think you all get a kick out of. Anybody have any questions? Okay, just let you know that when I fill out, when you all fill out the salmon forms and you all say, he didn't allow us to talk, I'm just going to go, oh, good one. <laughs> well, so I found it yesterday. I'll find it, maybe show it to you. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There's a... Um, the Roosevelt Library has all these transcripts of all these speeches Franklin gave from as a young man at Harvard all the way through the end of his life. And ooh, that's a unique picture. Um, in the archives, it's stationary for Roosevelt running for vice president. And it says Franklin D. Roosevelt for vice president in the middle. And then on the side in small letters, it says James Cox for president. <laughs> hmm. I mean, this is kind of like the, the thing he did with Daniels. Daniels, Secretary of State, Roosevelt, Secretary of Navy, Roosevelt, bigger letters. I mean, it's just, it's how Franklin works. So the stationery is very clear that he's running for vice president, but he's the focus. Um, and he builds up this reputation as, as being a straight shooter, as being somebody who everyone knows, people enjoy, people like. He's gregarious, he's funny, he's smart, he remembers names. He's got Louis Howe with him, who's taking notes all the time. Um, this is when he hires Missy Lehand, um, who later will become basically the first female chief of staff in, in the White House. Um, she comes on board as a secretary. Um, she's very good. She quickly understands how he works and um, does a good job of getting to the point she can actually read FDR's mind, finishes his sentences. Um, that's where she comes in. Um, there's a great picture of FDR at Hyde Park addressing the people of Dutchess County. And then every time I've gone there, I've, he's standing on the front porch with his hand extended. I've always stood in that exact same spot, done that exact same pose. It's a picture I remember. Uh, now, Mama loved the fact that the president was very proud of him, but she hated the fact there were 5,000 people on her lawn. Some things are just too much to ask of Mama. This is one of them. Um, but Eleanor is now, there's a great, oh, what's, she's really coming into her own um, during this time. She travels with Franklin on the campaign, um, probably to keep an eye on him. This is post the Lucy Mercer discovery. Um, but she's also now asked to make speeches on her own a few times. If they're in a town and there's a women's group, this is the first campaign for women allowed to vote. You can, she can go and do that. Um, and she's developing a bit of her own political persona. 
she starts meeting in this time people that will have a huge impact on her down the down the road. I'm gonna read you a quote about her, which I think is fascinating. And it gives her a chance to get away from Mama. <coughs> um, and you would want to get away from Mama. Mama said this to her grandchildren. What'd she say? Um, look for a second. So when your mother-in-law has said this to your children, your mother only bore you. I am more your mother than your mother is. Oh, wow. Whoa. You don't want to be like that woman. You may got out of town for a little bit. If that means you have to go with your husband on the train everywhere, and actually learn to speak a little bit and be in public, I think I see why she did it to get out of town. I mean, why would you want to have that? I mean, that's what, if your mother-in-law is telling your children that she's more your mother than you are, I, just, I don't understand that. Um, it's, it's quite, quite, I blanched when I read that. I thought that was really sad to hear. So I understand why Eleanor starts getting away, breaking away, having her own life, because that's part of what she's dealing with at home, is mama. Um, the Roosevelt, the Cox Roosevelt campaign does not go well. Um, they get beat badly. Um, and Franklin comes home, and now what does he do? He's already thinking of running for president in 1924. That he's 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 acquitted himself. If you don't um, um, find a way to get involved now, what do you do? He's kind of his career kind of comes to an abrupt halt for a minute. Um, but that's politics. I mean, timing really is everything. And reading the tea leaves and understanding when it's time to go and when it's not time to go is so important. Um, you got to know when to but, hope. Yeah, no. Thank you. And and sad we last week we lost Kenny Rogers. So, um, but it's just knowing in politics. I mean, everybody thought Barack Obama was nuts. He was a nobody. He was a state senator and a U.S. senator for two and a half years. Who does he think he's running for president? But he instinctively knew something. He had a sense of um, that it was his time. And that's what politicians, if they're good at what they do, if they want to be. Um, successful and move forward, they'll be aware of that. So um, he has done all these things and his career has kind of come to an end. He's hoping to maybe make a move in 24, 28, run for president. But how do you keep yourself involved in those jobs? There's a Republican administration not going to invite him down to D.C. to be anything in politics anymore. It's done. Um, so he went back and he for um did some law practice. He worked at the Fidelity and Deposit Company. Um, and he built time to kind of build up his political. He would go speak to any political group that would have him talk, not just in New York, but other places. Um, in the summer of 1921, he went to a Boy Scout gathering on Bear, in Bear Mountain State Park in New York, just near West Point. Um, if you've never been to the Hudson Valley, it's a beautiful place to go and go in the fall. Absolutely beautiful. It's not too far from Hyde Park, but the history of that part of the world with the revolution and other things is just, it's what you think of when you think of fall colors. The Hudson Valley is great. Beautiful, beautiful. He goes to a Boy Scout gathering. He's been invited to come speak about <clears throat> leadership and, and all these sort of things to a bunch of Boy Scouts. And um, it's a wonderful event for him, except he, they now think he drank water. And I'll show you the picture that was infected. Speaking of the viruses, with the polio virus, <clears throat> I'll show you the picture. This picture right here, it's Franklin at the Boy Scout rally. That's the last picture of him walking unaided. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Huh. Huh. So, and that's the big thing we'll talk about next week, is we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> these things that happened to him, all kind of in a period of two or three years. His marriage falls apart. His health falls apart. His career falls apart. Um, and this is an amazing time for him. It's an amazing... Um, coming to grips with the fragility of life, I think, for this guy. We all go through these things. 
We've all gotten sick. We've all had this happen to us. Life is life, and it comes at you pretty fast sometimes. Some people can get through it. Some people can't. Roosevelt didn't think he'd get through it for a while. This was a horrible time for him. And a guy who's so vital, so full of life, and he's just turned 40 years old to have this happen to him? It's almost unbelievable. But it's part of what makes his story so compelling. So fascinating. Um, so <clears throat> why don't we leave this at about 1921 when we pick up next week, FDR will have come back from this Boy Scout event. He will have gone to Campobello for a couple of weeks in the summertime. If you ever want to find online or any place, this is a wonderful movie from 1960, Sunrise at Campobello with Ralph Bellamy and Greer Garson. Um, and lots of other fascinating actors and actresses of the era. <clears throat> the story of um, the fight back from polio. But um, unless you have any other questions, let's leave it there. The late summer of 21, Franklin Roosevelt is on vacation and he comes back one afternoon from a swim in time with his kids or the little chicks as they call them. And he goes to bed not feeling well. And the next morning when he wakes up, he can't walk. Mm. It was that quick. His whole life has changed. Wow. So, um, again, <laughs> check out the Francis Perkins special. If you can find it again, it should be on PBS at some point. I'm sure somebody in their sneaky way has videotaped it and put it on YouTube as well. Um, research about her, some of the other things online. Um, and again, I know this isn't exactly the best way to do this class. We'd have much more interaction if we were in the same room together. Um, but we'll get back there and we'll do this again next time. And I think we're doing okay. You guys are all right with it? All right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yep. Good. Right. Excellent. Right. Doing a great job, Mike. Well, I'm trying. As long <laughs> very, as that very good. Excellent. Doesn't keep bothering me or that dog or that, that doctor wife of mine. Oh, yeah, yeah. People give me no advice. <laughs> so, all right, uh, any questions? Okay, Mike, one question. How yeah. long did he serve when he went? Was it World War One, or whatever, when you said he went over? Did he, he was over there for, for a month or so, just on a tour. Oh, Navy that was soldier. just a tour. He was not, he yeah, was not he got, involved. He wanted yeah, to okay. go as a soldier, and they wouldn't let him do it. They're like, well, oh. I'll let you go. I think he did browbeat Daniel so much. He's like, well, hey, I want to get your ass out of here because you're pouring the hell out of me. Okay. He, I understand you need to go see what's going on. Okay. You know, it's like Lincoln wanted to go fight. He would have loved to pick up a, a, a carbine and go off to fight the Confederates. They wouldn't let him do it. The closest they let him do was to go to Fort Stevens and a ring of forts around Washington. He went to a fort, and actually the Confederates came within a couple hundred yards of the fort were shelling it. And um, uh. Lincoln stood up on the parapet looking out. Oh, there come the Rebs over there. And a bullet took his hat off. Oh, goodness. Oh, geez. And the grabbed this, this Union captain grabbed him and said, get down, you damn fool. They're going to kill you. And he grabbed oh. him. He realized who it was. And then picked him up and said, oh, Mr. President, I'm sorry. You knew who the captain was? Oh. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Oh, my God. Oh, gee. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> it's a small oh, wow. so I'll sing the Disney song. Uh, okay. Again, if you have questions or anything, email me. Thank uh, you. Whatever. And Thanks, we'll see you guys. Mike. I'll let you know the nice. schedule for the speakers, and we'll get that figured out. Nice job. Nice. I want to know nice. how, much, how much longer this beard and mustache is going to be when we see you it next It grows back. I shaved it off last week. It's got to come back. Look, it gets, gets grayer every time. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to start buying me some gray out or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Peace. Be safe. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.